So it's a good time. May is National Lyme Disease Prevention Month. So it's a good time to talk about ticks. But more importantly, we live in Northern Wisconsin and our biggest neighbor is Lake Superior, which at times can be quite powerful and sometimes dangerous. However, our tiniest neighbor that we share the land with might be just as threatening to even more people than the big lake. And that of course is ticks. To understand why ticks are problematic, we want to share with you two speakers, both working with the Midwest Center of Excellence in Vector-Borne Disease. I'm excited to introduce to you our first speaker, Dr. Susan Paskowitz, who will set the stage for us to tell us about how ticks came to be in Wisconsin, how climate change may be affecting tick populations, and some of the research projects underway at the center that may reduce some of the threats of these tiny critters. Dr. Susan Paskowitz is chair of the University of Wisconsin's entomology department, and she's the director of the Midwest Center of Excellence in Vector-Borne Disease. Her research program focuses on medically important arthropods, including ticks and mosquitoes, and the human pathogens they transmit. She teaches classes in global health and medical entomology, and her research scientists work on problems of local and global health impacts. Her current projects include ecological and epidemiological work that targets disease reduction. And she also conducts outreach on tick-borne and mosquito diseases and prevention, which is why she's a perfect fit for us today. Welcome, Dr. Pascal. Thank you, Lissa. It's a real pleasure to be here with you this morning. So I'm delighted to get to talk a little bit about one of my favorite subjects, uh, and that is ticks and tick-borne disease in Wisconsin. And I'm just going to share my screen so that we can uh, have some images to go along with this talk this morning. Does that look OK to everyone? Uh, if you want to do that quick swap again, that would be great. Sure. How's that? Perfect. All right. So as Lissa said, I'm the director of the Midwest Center of Excellence for Vector-Borne Disease here in Madison. And the center uh, specializes in trying to work on the development and the testing of methods to reduce human risk of exposure to both ticks and to mosquitoes. So today I'm really gonna focus on the tick part of our portfolio, but we also have uh, interesting work on mosquitoes. And if you wanted to learn about that at a later date, uh, we could come back. And when I say ticks, um, in Wisconsin, all of you in the audience probably know that there are two different species that are commonly encountered. And one of those is the wood tick, which you see pictured here on the left. Um, the other is the deer tick. And it's the deer tick that I'm really going to focus my talk on today because it's the deer tick that's responsible for transmission of the vast majority of the human illness in our state. Um, I'm also going to just mention briefly here that sometimes you're going to hear me talk about the deer tick as the black-legged tick, which is the approved scientific common name for this particular species. Uh, but I think most people in Wisconsin are more familiar with it by this name deer tick. So that's also what I'll probably use throughout if I can remember to do that. So deer tick is what we're really going to focus on. And deer tick is of interest to, I'm sure, everybody who's attending today because of its role in transmission of Lyme disease. You probably are aware that there has been a, a big reevaluation of the impacts of Lyme disease in the United States over the last five to 10 years, uh, and a recognition that it is a vastly underreported disease. Um, so, of course, agencies like the CDC and Wisconsin's Department of Health Services, their data is only as good as what is reported to them. Um, and in investigating just how good that reporting system is, CDC's used a lot of other methods like asking doctors directly and looking at diagnostic tests uh, results to, re to come to the conclusion that the 
reported estimates are probably underestimating by about tenfold. So, you know, if you look on their website or the website of our DHS, you're going to see maybe 3,000 cases in Wisconsin, maybe 30,000 or 40,000 uh, actually reported to CDC, but that's, again, this enormous underestimation. Uh, um, and uh, Along this line, just think about um, the importance of Lyme disease in our own state. Uh, we are one of the high incidence states in the US for this particular uh, disease. What you're seeing in this map is a dot placed for every single case that was reported in 2019, which is the latest map that CDC has produced. And definitely Wisconsin uh, in the upper Midwest is a hot spot, along with Minnesota here. You're beginning to see some creep over into Michigan, that's relatively new, uh, and down into uh, the Chicago area. That probably represents people who are traveling and then going back home and getting diagnosed uh, locally. The the other big hot spot, of course, is out on the East Coast. This is a, a graph from our DHS, again, uh, that you could access through their website that shows you what the patterns have looked like in Wisconsin over time. And this is from 1990 all the way to 2020. And you see this growth in the number of cases in our state. So it was pretty steady when I first arrived here back in the 1990s. And I always would tell my students that we had, you know, 400, 500 cases roughly of Lyme each year. In recent years, the reported cases, though, have doubled and even tripled and more. So now every year, uh, the reports are in that three to 4,000 range. And again, that's an underestimate. So it's probably more like 30 to 40,000 cases, which is pretty similar to what we see with some of the sexually transmitted uh, infections. I thought you might be interested in uh, ways to access data for your particular counties. And so I just wanted to point you in this direction of uh, the Environmental Public Health Tracker, which is very useful uh, update each year, again, of these reported cases. And you can go in and highlight your own county uh, and see what things have looked like over time. So I put Ashland County in here. You can change the year. You can uh, change the way the data is reported. So I think I'm giving you just the incidents here. So the number of cases per 100,000, but you can also look at the absolute case numbers reported for the county. So that uh, is a useful site that you might enjoy just investigating your own uh, individual locations using. So I talked, you know, to introduce today's talks a little bit about Lyme disease, and that certainly is the tick transmitted disease that is responsible for most of the illness in our state, but it's not the only one. And one thing that I do want to stress, because I've heard from so many people and including some of my own friends, um, is that there are other things that can make you sick. And those don't always seem to be uh, screened for when people go to see their health providers. So, you know, they're not as common, but we do have cases of human anaplasmosis, uh, the average now around 427 reported cases each year, but as high as in the 700s in some years. Um, we also have a, a disease that's a kind of a malaria-like uh, parasite called babesiosis. And again, not very common, but, you know, we have more than 50 cases reported each year, and that has been going up a bit uh, in the last few years. So those two things in particular are things to be aware of and to make sure that uh, you at least have that conversation with your doctor if you, if you you know, get a negative test, for example, for something else. There are other things. Um, we have this ehrlichiosis now. We have a, a virus. We have a relapsing fever uh, type pathogen. All of those are very rare. So we're seeing things like one to four cases a year for re the relapsing fever, one to seven for the virus in the range of four to 13 for um, at least the local form of ehrlichiosis. So those are not common, but they're also out there and things to be aware of. And then the last thing that I put on this slide uh, is in highlighted here in yellow. And this is a group of pathogens called spotted fever group, where we currently have about three to 30 cases reported uh, you know, across 10, 20 years worth of data. Um, 
And I highlighted that because there does seem to be a lot of confusion right now about what's going on with this. And I think that has to do with the way the diagnosis is reported. Sometimes that comes back as Rocky Mounted Spotted Fever, but that's a very specific bacterial agent causing that disease. There are actually quite a few related things that we all put together in this spotted fever group. And you can be positive for a spot of fever group, but have only something that doesn't make you sick at all or is very mild. So just because you get a diagnosis of spotted fever group doesn't mean that you've had Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which would be exceedingly rare in our state. We've only ever had one documented case where it was identified definitively using genetics as the Rocky Mountain spotted fever agent. So just something to be aware of that's, uh, it, could be confusing. So what the Midwest Center of Excellence and my research team is interested in is understanding what drives risk to people. And we're very interested in that for a number of reasons. One, to understand the patterns that we see across the state, um, but also most importantly, to see what are the kinds of things that we might do to help to reduce the risk to humans. And Dr. Zia Lee, uh, who's the new state uh, uh, vector-borne disease specialist, um, is going to talk about a lot of our projects on trying to mitigate risk or reduce risk to humans. I'm going to set a little bit of the background here for you before he goes on to talk about those projects. So I would just want to start with an introduction to tick biology. Um, it's very different from mosquitoes, the other group that we work on, in that, you know, the stages pretty much look like each other morphologically. Um, it's also a really long life cycle, so it takes two to three years to go from egg all the way to adult, whereas a mosquito might get through its life cycle in just a couple weeks. So the eggs, when they hatch, are these little six-legged larvae that, as I'm getting older, are harder and harder for me to even see. These are very tiny. Uh, and those larvae then will molt to the next stage, which is the little eight-legged nymph that you see here. And then the nymph will molt to become either a female or a male. One interesting thing is when we've got the teenager or the, or the uh, larval forms here, the larvae or the nymph, we can't tell which sex they're going to be when they grow up. So uh, they're, they don't have any kind of definitive characteristics that would uh, identify them. One of the things that's important to note here is that we think that it's this small nymphal stage that is doing most of the transmission of disease. And that's not to say that the adult females can't. The males don't really take much blood, but the females do. Um, but it's just that the females are quite a bit larger, and, and so they're more, you're more likely to find them on your person than you are one of these really small nymphs. And when we look at the epidemiological patterns, so the patterns in, in time of when people are reporting getting infected, that really lines up with the peak activity period for the nymphs. So I want to highlight that when you're doing your tick checks, you really should be sure that you know what you're looking for, what the size of this uh, organism is uh, that could be transmitting disease. And I, this is the infamous CDC poppy seed uh, muffin. So I hope none of you are having poppy seed muffins, lemon poppy seed muffins for your breakfast while you're listening to me talk this morning. But this got quite a lot of press because uh, people were appalled, you know, and disgusted by this, but there are actually ticks on this muffin to make the point of just how tiny, again, those, uh, those nymphal stages are about the side of a poppy seed. And if you can't see them there, they're right about there. And that's, again, uh, just to give you that visual image. Um, all stages of ticks only feed on blood. Uh, mosquitoes will feed on blood, the females will, but also on sugar, they'll take nectar from plants. Ticks don't do that. They only feed on blood and they're on their host for a long time where mosquitoes might be on you for three to five minutes. Ticks will be on you for up to seven days to acquire a complete meal. So here you see a female um, going through her week long feeding period and taking in just massive amounts of blood over that period of time. This slide I also wanted to use to highlight this wonderful website um, called Tick Encounter, which has a lot of very useful information. And I recommend that if you're interested, you go check them out. 
And then this is a, just again, to make that point about how tiny the nymphs are, this is a little tiny blood fed nymph that had completely fed on my own uh, person. And just to reiterate how difficult it is to find them. So this one had been on for four days right before I was heading out for a vacation. And I was really worried that I was gonna get ill you know, from something while I was away. So I ended up talking to my doctor and getting a prophylactic treatment of antibiotic before I left. That blood feeding habit is really important because that's how these ticks access the Lyme disease spirochetes and the other pathogens. They get them while they're feeding on wildlife. This is a little white-footed mouse. There are also deer mice that are prevalent up in your part of the state, and those are really good sources for infecting ticks. Shrews, chipmunks, those are also things that are known to be good reservoirs for many of these pathogens. And so what you see is that when the larvae hatch, they're not infected for the most part. Um, almost all of these pathogens are not going to transmit from the adult female through to the eggs. So that larva has to feed on something to pick up the pathogen. It's often one of these little mice or these other small mammals. If that small mammal is infected with Lyme disease or something else, then the larva can pick it up. And then when it molts into that next stage, then the nymph, which has not yet gotten its blood meal, is infected and it can feed on you and transmit to you. Or more likely, of course, it's going to be feeding on small mammals and transmitting back to them. The nymph then after it's got its blood meal will turn into the adult. And if it was infected, that adult will also be infected. Um, the adult are usually about twice the prevalence of infection is what we see in the nymphs because they've had two chances. They could have gotten infected when they were a larva or when they were a nymph. The other thing I wanted to say here is that adults do a lot of their feeding on uh, large mammals. We never find them on the small mammals. So a lot of their feeding is on white-tailed deer. The deer are not a reservoir for the pathogens. So at least for the Lyme disease pathogen, they're not a reservoir. So they're very important in terms of feeding lots of adults and allowing those adults then to make lots of uh, eggs and lots of larvae keeping the cycle going, but they're not important as a reservoir for the pathogens. Okay, one more little piece about tick biology because it helps to understand why we find them where we find them. They are exceedingly susceptible to drying out, especially the deer tick. The, the wood tick, not as much. They can be in much more open, sunny areas. But these little uh, deer ticks just are not good in hot, bright, sunny areas. And so the primary place where we're going to be running into them is in forests. That's their primary habitat. I do want to mention, though, that we've been doing a lot of work with communities uh, and looking at some of the control uh, tools that we could implement in around homes. And we are finding, of course, that homes that abut woods, like you're seeing in the corner here, those are places where right up at that uh, intersection of the wood and the lawn, there can be plenty of ticks there. But even at spilling over into the lawn sometimes, we've been really surprised to see once in a while, we'll pick up a nymphal deer tick out in the bright, sunny patch of grass like you're seeing at the bottom here, and even in some of the drying uh, areas right around the house. So I don't know how long they last there, but we definitely have on occasion picked up live ticks in those areas. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the history uh, of what we've seen in our state. I showed you the trends and how we've seen this increasing trajectory for many of the pathogens uh, in terms of human cases. So I want to talk a bit about some of the factors that are contributing to that now. And I'll just start by saying that the first records that we have of deer ticks in Wisconsin are from um, a mammal that was trapped in 1958. And I just found this maybe three or four years ago. I finally found it in the Wisconsin uh, Insect Research Collection, which is a museum with millions of specimens of insects from our state. And I got in there and looked at all the ticks and I was amazed to find this old uh, sample that had been collected from a weasel actually. 
Um, other than that, the first records were from some forestry workers and others up in Lincoln County in 1965. And they reported to the person who was in my position, the medical entomologist at UW-Madison, that they were seeing some new things um, and they sent them down to him. And when he evaluated them, he realized that these were uh, something that hadn't been collected here before, the, these deer ticks. And after that, nobody was really very interested until, of course, the discovery of Lyme in the 1970s and the recognition that the deer tick was involved in transmission of that pathogen. And so at that point, um, a number of people in Wisconsin through the Department of Health Services and over here at the university got involved in trying to map just how widespread was this tick in the state. And so we did this by uh, going to the first day of gun deer season. And any hunter who would allow us, uh, we would look at their deer, we would collect all the ticks that we could find in one particular part of the body. And then we would go back and map, okay, well, how many ticks did we find on the deer and how many of the deer actually had these ticks on them? And you can see in this whole series of maps through time that we, for, during the first surveys, they were really intense up in that northwestern part of the state, but even a few in the central and even in the southern over there in the, at the uh, arena site, but not, nothing really uh, in the eastern part of our state. So, you know, fast forward another 13 years to 1994, and now you're seeing a lot more in the central part of the state, still nothing really in the eastern part of the state. And then the last one that I ran was in 2008, 2009. And that by that point, you could really start to see indications of populations all in virtually every single site that we look. So getting over into the eastern part of the state as well. So this is all to make the point that the ticks have not been static. Um, they have been moving and spreading since that original detection in Lincoln County back in the 1960s. And as the ticks move, so did the Lyme disease. So here you can see um, the average incidence by county uh, over the time period of 1990 through 2010. And that lines up really well with what we were seeing with the movement of the ticks over that time. And what I can say is that's that those series stopped in 2010, but we have continued to map where the ticks are present uh, by county over the last uh, five to 10 years. And what we can say now is that they're everywhere. Every single county with the exception of Winnebago County now has a documented uh, established population. So population where there's breeding and reproduction from year to year. It's not just one tick dropped off one time because a, a dog or a deer passed through the county. These are established populations um, in at least one place. And so of course the whole county is not necessarily gonna be positive for ticks, but the, if there's a forested area, um, all of them, except for Winnebago County, have an established population. And some of the reasons for that, we think this change um, have to do with big changes in the US over the last 100, 150 years. In part, you know, I told you that these sticks are really susceptible to drying out, and so they need forested areas. And if you look at this series of maps comparing the area of virgin forest in the US on the uh, left side of the screen here, you see the big changes uh, in 1850 to 1926, where virtually all of the virgin forest was logged off. So that was a big change, and that meant that there was a big reduction in habitat that was needed to support the ticks. Um, we also talked about the fact that deer are really important in terms of feeding the adult ticks and therefore keeping the tick population up. And the deer population too plummeted around 1900. And this is probably because of overhunting. Um, and I know that in Wisconsin, for example, there was commercial hunting of the deer population uh, in order to feed some of the loggers, to feed the logging camps. Apparently they also would ship some of the deer meat down to Chicago. So there's a big change in the deer population, a big change in the forested area, which meant that the ticks pretty much got 
um, relegated to just a few small habitats that were uh, effective and, and would support their development. And then the other thing has been the climate change. And people often think that what we're seeing is a direct result of climate change, but it's more complicated than that. Yes, temperatures have been going up and that means that what we're seeing is probably more efficient reproduction and also an extension of the season when ticks can be active, but that's not the whole story. That's probably part of why we're seeing more and we're seeing spread up into Canada now. Definitely that's a climate change issue. We're also seeing them spread south though, and that can't be because temperatures are, are warming. That's a different aspect that has to do with these other ecological and, and uh, wildlife changes. So those are some of the reasons why we think we're seeing some of the big changes in our state. And I'll tell you just a little bit now about some of our surveillance studies and the things that we've done and try to relate them back to the northern part of Wisconsin where you are. So um, uh, our studies in terms of surveillance, I've really focused on trying to understand where the ticks are, as I just described, and some of the risk and how abundant the ticks are in these different locations and why that can vary so much from place to place looking at how prevalent the different infections are in the ticks and then how much that varies over time. So how, how good could we be at predicting where, where a particular place or a particular time is gonna be a bad, uh, bad time and place for, for ticks? So here's just an example of how we do some of this work. We use this um, method for collecting ticks called tick dragging and that um, is pulling this white piece of fabric across the landscape on, down on the ground as much as possible for a set distance. And that gives us a measure of abundance. And then those ticks get returned to the lab to look at the infection status. And then here's an example of the kind of work um, at some of our sentinel sites where we try to go back to year after year so we can then have a good answer for the question, is this a bad tick year? Um, we go to three state parks, council grounds uh, up in the northern part of Hartman Creek, down around Stevens Point, and then Tower Hills, which is down here south, about an hour west of Madison. And you can see here um, for the same distance dragged in each of these locations, council grounds is very low compared to the other two sites. The peak week is usually the third week in June to that first week in uh, July. And there can be a lot of variation in what a peak looks like. So in council grounds, it was only 11 nymphs across that distance, whereas in Tower Hills, you know, that same week, we got eight times as many. So a lot of variation from location to location. We also take those ticks back and then we do diagnostics on them in the lab to understand what they're infected with. And then we can get some estimates of what the prevalence looks like. So this is just one of our maps from 2018, where you can look in the Western part and see that about 11% of the 333 ticks we tested that year uh, were infected much higher up here. It was about 19% uh, in the Northern region. Um, and even higher when we got to the Northeast. So those samples of that 100 ticks was about 30%. And that's typical, that kind of variation from, from location to late location, but it's not, um, it's not standard. So if we went back another year and looked at this, we might see now it's 29% in the Northern region and 14% in the Western. It varies quite a bit from year to year. I did want to share some of the Douglas County data because we were up there last year. We haven't worked in Douglas County very much. Um, we have some older data from Ashland County that I won't share, but that was from Copper Falls State Park. But last year we did go up to um, the to the Brule River State Forest, and this was the result of the diagnostics from that from that collection. About 14% of the ticks were infected with Borrelia burgdorferi. Another 4% had that anaplasma. 2% um, were infected with Babesia. And 2% have this fairly rare pathogen called Ehrlichia murus. Um, some of those ticks were co-infected. So when we did see a co-infection, it was always a Borrelia burgdorferi with something else. Some of our other locations, that's not always the case, but for the Douglas County sample, um, that's what that information looked like. 
Um, on average, across our state, about 20%, 19 to 20% of nymphs are infected with the Lyme disease spirochete and about 6.5% with anaplasma. Um, again, for Lyme, it's about double what we see in the nymphs. So 30 to 40% of the adult deer ticks are infected with Lyme. And then the last thing I'm going to say before I turn it over to Dr. Lee is just, uh, again, this emphasis of our research programs on trying to reduce the risk of tick-borne disease. And he'll talk quite a bit about some of our studies on that front. I just want to highlight one of them, which is using this tool called the Tick app. Um, and this is something that you can download for your phone. Uh, you would be part of a citizen science research project if you chose to do that. And we're trying to understand more about what people are actually doing when they're being exposed to these ticks. And part of that is, is it more recreational? Is it when you're outside mowing your lawn that day? Um, what kinds of things are you doing? And are there better ways that we can incorporate those things in our uh, outreach and in our educational programs. If you do download the TIC, one of the useful features, um, or the TIC app, one of the useful, useful features is that you can report a TIC to us. So you can take a picture, send it to us. Someone on our end will identify it. And we try to do this within 24 hours, get that information right back to you and give you some sense of, of what we think you ought to do as a result of that exposure. So. That's um, that's what, where I'm going to end it, Lissa, and you can turn it over to Zia now. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Paskowitz. That, that's amazing. You've given us a lot to think about, about the habitat that we live in and what we need to be looking for when we're outside. I want to quick remind everybody that we um, are taking all your questions in the Q&A box and we'll queue them all up after our next speaker. Feel free to keep putting comments into the chat and check our chat box for more resources that you can use on these topics as they come up. So our next speaker is Dr. Zia Lee. Dr. Lee is a vector biologist, also working in the center's lab. He's conducting research in tick questing behavior, as well as management strategies for ticks in recreational parks and residential properties. He started his work on vector-borne diseases as an undergrad by looking at potential biological control agents for the West Nile virus in mosquitoes found in catch basins. He has a master's and PhD in entomology from UW-Madison. Dr. Lee will tell us about his research projects looking at tick control and prevention strategies. So welcome to Dr. Lee. All right, can we, can we all see that? Um, we don't see your screen yet, Dr. Lee. There we do, thank you. Okay, <laughs> awesome. All right, well, thank you, Alyssa, for the, uh, the invitation. I'm excited uh, to be here and uh, to talk about some of the uh, control projects that we've done at the centers and then you know, provide some, uh, some advice on what you can do in your own uh, yards. So as stated by, um, by Susan, that ticks are, are, are a huge problem here um, in Wisconsin, in particular the black-legged tick, as it's a vector of a number of tick-borne diseases, um, including the uh, number one reported vector-borne disease in um, the United States, Lyme disease. And of course, this tick, as Susan has mentioned, can be found in a wide variety of habitats, included um, wooded forests, um, uh, that can be found on recreational uh, in recreational parks. So here, for example, is an image of a trail. I um, mean, on the sides of these trails where the vegetations are, that's where you could run into a tick. That's where you can encounter a tick. And um, surprisingly, you can also encounter a tick on, on the trail itself because this trail has a lot of vegetation, a lot of pine needles that are on it, which creates a great uh, uh, habitat for ticks to sort of lie in wait as you walk by. And of course, as also uh, uh, pointed out by Susan, you can also encounter ticks in your own backyard as well. So, you know, you can encounter ticks on the lawn. Um, we've encountered ticks um, definitely along the, uh, the lawn edge between the, uh, you know, in that, at the woodland 
and the uh, the grass interface, and you know, and there's a little pile of woods over here too, um, where you can also encounter ticks, because um, that's great habitat for the small mammals that are good hosts for ticks. Um, and so for this presentation, I'm going to talk about you know the tick control and prevention strategies that um, that we've done here uh, at the lab. Um, and so, you know, just focus on some of our research projects. And then finally, just give you some tips and advice on what you can do to prevent tick bites while you're out in the, the woods or while you're out going for a walk. And so I'll start with um, some of the work that we've done in our in residential areas. And so here, you know, there's there's recommendations for you to, you know, apply pesticides in order to uh, kill ticks that may be on your property. Um, you know, some ways to remove ticks from the and control ticks from resident uh, in residential property is to create you know tick safe zones and you can do that by uh, removing leaf litter and shrubs that create good habitat for ticks ticks don't like it when it's too hot and dry and so there's a, a lot of leaf litter where they can go under and hide underneath it to stay hydrated um, it creates that nice habitat um you know, it's also a recommendation that you mow frequently although um, we'll talk a little bit about that later um, that may or may not work out um, and of course, you know, do whatever you can to discourage unwelcome animals. You know, as mentioned by Susan, that animals are hosts for ticks and they can ferry ticks around in the, uh, the environment. They can move them from the woods into your lawn, move them from the woods into um, near your, how, your homes. And so, you know, anything you can do to discourage the movement of animals is highly recommended. Um, so the first project I want to talk about is this DIY tick control project, um, and you know which stems from the question of whether or not over-the-counter products are effective at controlling ticks. And so these are products that you'll be able to find um, at you know your your local stores, such as you know Walmart, Home Depot, um, Menards, and so forth. Uh, and and this is you know in contrast to um, hiring a pest control operator, which can be very expensive. You know, you can you know it can cost you three hundred to five hundred. Um, or even more to hire someone to come in, uh, spray your property for ticks um, and other insects. And so the question we had here was, can we use something like this? Can we go out to you know, uh, our local hardware store, purchase some of these general um, insecticides and use it, these general insecticides that are labeled to kill ticks and use it um, and see if they're effective or not. And so in this case, we found a product called triazocide, which contains um, a permethrin, a pyrethroid, um, and so, you know, one bag like this um, at the store will cost you about 10 to $15 and it covers about 12,000 square foot. Um, and so two bags of these will, you know, is for about 20 to $30 is enough to cover the average home um, lot, which is about half an acre. And so it's a question of, do you spend 30 to $50 to treat your whole property yourself? Or do you hire someone else um, at a higher cost to treat it for you? And of course there are, um, you know, some questions about your own level of comfort with treating um, your own property as well. But here we just want to um, answer the question of whether or not these products are effective at controlling ticks in your own yard. And so for this study, we, um, we recruited a number of households at um, different communities. Um, at these households, we went in, we established these little you know, 30 by uh, 10 meter plots along the wood edge and the lawn. And then we went out and we assessed um, for ticks. And so this is the tick dragging that, um, that Susan had mentioned before, went out there, we dragged for ticks, and then we treated the homes, and then we assessed um, at a later point. And so just to, uh, to walk you through our results here, so we have our two communities, um, one over in, in Eau Claire, and then one over by the Dells. On the y-axis here, we have the proportion of homes that, where we did find ticks, and then on the axis, axis is our sampling week. And so if we look at the week prior to um, applying uh, this, this acaricide or this insecticide to properties, you can see that between our placebo, our homes where we did not treat, um, uh, and then our homes where we did treat, that we didn't see any differences in the number of homes where we did find um, the black legged tick. And then if we fast forward that a week after we treated these homes, you can see that there's a huge difference between the number of homes where we did find ticks. Um, so, you know, here we found more ticks in the homes where we did not treat compared to the homes that we did treat. And if we go through the rest of the, the summer, we can see that that same pattern holds true. Um, so to go back and answer the question, are over-the-counter um, products effective at controlling ticks? Um, and, you know, based on our research, I'd say yes. Um, but that's a yes with a really big asterisk because um, that just, you know, that, that, 
that research project was only done with one product and that's the product that um, is here on the screen. And so, you know, the question of whether or not the other products are effective um, is, is up for grabs. You know, I would, my assumption would be yes, they, that if applied correctly, that they would be as effective. Um, but, you know, we don't have the research uh, data to, to support that. Um, on a larger scale in recreational parks, there are a number of things that you can do to um, control ticks. So, you know, these are just some examples of what uh, have been done and sort of walk through the, you know, through a park or uh, through the woods, you know, so things such as changing the forest structure composition, making it less um, shaded and opening up some of the, the, the canopy, um, change the park use patterns for visitors, you know, you use signage to uh, warn visitors that you know you're walking into a tick infested area and you know reminding visitors to use DEET or treat themselves with some sort of repellent to make sure that ticks you know, when they get on you they'll, they'll fall off quickly and of course you can also change that risk by changing trail maintenance like I said before you know if you take that trail um, from this picture and if you remove all of the, the leaf the needles and the leaf litter in the trail you can reduce the, um, the probability of coming into contact with a tick uh, significantly. Um, but more importantly, um, some years ago, somebody came to us and they were interested in whether or not mowing would reduce tick, uh, black legged ticks or ticks on hiking trails. And so this is important because, you know, as I mentioned before, mowing or frequent lawn mowing, sorry, frequent mowing of lawns <laughs> is a recommended <coughs> strategy for reducing ticks. Um, but we don't have a lot of evidence to support that. And so we took this question um, and we, we sort of ran with it. Um, and we went up to Northern Minnesota to conduct some studies here. And so in this case, we um, took a bunch of trails and, you know, this, you know, you can see this trail here um, on one half of the trail, we cut the, the grass and vegetation there. And on the other half, we just sort of left it alone for the rest of the summer. Um, and then we dragged for ticks to see if whether or not that mowing um, reduced ticks in those areas. And so just to give you a short walk through of our experiment here and the results here on the y-axis, we have the total number of ticks at our three parks here. We have Mobile Maze, Spearhead, and Three Island. Um, and then the x-axis, we have our sampling week. And so we checked ticks during the first week um, prior to cutting the, the, the vegetation. And we checked it um, you know, for the rest of the summer as well at weekly intervals. I and mean, just to give you a quick look at this, this is Ixodes scapularis nymph. These are the small little ticks that are um, that we think are most likely responsible for causing a lot of the cases of Lyme disease in um, across the United States. And you can see here, you know, we have our control, our unmown sections in red, and our mowed sections in blue. You can see that there's no difference over the course of time. That mowing didn't really change or didn't really affect the ticks on these uh, trails. If you look at adult ticks, adult uh, exotic scapularis or adult black legged ticks, it's the same thing that mowing didn't change their numbers, you know, over the course of the summer. And then if we look at the wood tick, same thing. Um, we mowed, saw no difference, no impact of mowing on the number of ticks on these trails. So to go back to the question, did mowing reduce the number of black legged ticks on our hiking trails? Uh, my answer to that is no. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we did, we mowed and we saw no difference. We saw no impact on, on the number of ticks on these trails. So another um, project that we did was to assess whether or not these tick tubes, so these tick tubes um, are, are built to target the host, the animals, the small mammals in this case. So um, in particular, the white-footed mice, which are great hosts for ticks and great reservoirs for the pathogen, um, for a number of pathogens, including Burlibidor fry, the Lyme disease pathogen. Um, and the idea here is that, you know, when the ticks feed on the animals, they'll pick up the pathogen. But if you can kill the ticks before um, they can uh, fully feed and fall off, then you can effectively reduce the risk of, of, of coming to contact with ticks by reducing the overall number of ticks in the environment. Um, and so if you have these tick tubes and these and within these tick tubes are a bunch of cotton balls that are treated with an insecticide, in this case, a permethrin, um, the animals, the small mice here, love use, to, to use this as bedding materials. And so the idea here is that they'll grab that material, take it to their nest, um, build a little bed with it. And then, you know, when they roll around in that um, cotton, the t if there are any ticks on the animals, that, that the ticks will get a lethal dose of that permethrin of that insecticide and it'll kill the ticks. Um, so in theory, that's how it should work. 
And so we did our own little experiment using little PCV tubes that we stuffed filled with um, cotton balls that were treated with permethrin. Um, and we left it out in the woods um, in these plots. And then we assessed whether or not the permethrin would have an impact on the number of ticks that we found in the environment. And then the number of ticks that we found on hosts. So in this case, the white footed mice. Um, and so, you know, this is what we're interested in, whether or not there are any ticks in the environment and whether or not there are any ticks on the hosts. No. Um, and from this study, we saw that the permethrin did reduce the number of ticks on hosts, you know, in this case, again, white footed mice, you know, by, by quite, quite a large number. So 90% of the ticks that were on the animals um, were essentially, you know, we saw a 90% reduction in the number of ticks that were on the animals. Um, but in the environment, we only saw a 54% reduction in the number of ticks. So not, not by that much. Um, another strategy that has sort of been um, um, talked about for control of ticks is the removal of invasive vegetation. And so, you know, Japanese barberry, for example, is another um, invasive vegetation that's linked closely with tick abundance. If you remove Japanese barberry, you are removing suitable habitat for ticks and for other hosts. And so by doing that, you're removing ticks from the environment, essentially. Um, and so in this case, we were interested in whether or not removing um, buckthorn and Japanese uh, honeysuckle, sorry, a more honeysuckle would uh, reduce the number of ticks. You know, if you look here on this image on the left, we have what the forest looks like before we remove the veg those invasive vegetations. And you can see it's pretty dense. My student here had trouble going through that vegetation. And after you remove it, you can see there's a huge difference. The canopy opens up. You can see that there's light now um, on, the, uh, on the canopy floor. And so it's a huge difference in the landscape once to remove those invasives. And so the question is whether or not removal of those invasives would impact tick numbers. Um, and likewise, we, um, you know, we asked the same question as whether or not those the removal of those invasives would reduce the number of ticks in the environment and then the number of ticks on hosts. Um, and to do that, we set up these little grids and then we trap for animals in these grids to, um, to see if whether or not there were any differences in tick numbers on those animals. And we also remove the invasives from this little plot um, as well. And so from that study, we saw that in the environment, we did see a reduction in number of ticks, but again, very much like the permethrin treated tubes, um, it was about 50%, you know, it wasn't, um, it wasn't as large as what we would expect. But, you know, um, interestingly on the host, on the animals, we didn't see any reductions of, of ticks on those animals. So those animals still look like they were, um, that they normally would if the vegetation, if the vases were still there. And that, that you know, that could be for a number of reasons, um, which I probably, which I won't, really touch up on uh, too much on here, but you know, our assumptions are that because the animals can move much further, they probably are moving into different areas where there are still ticks and areas where we're not uh, removing invasive uh, vegetation. So we may potentially, if our project and our plots were much bigger, we could have seen some sort of uh, reduction of ticks on these animals. But for the plot sizes that we use, they were similar to um, you know, a, a typical household plot size of about half an acre. And so, you know, on your own property, that's about half an acre. If you remove the invasive vegetation within that area, you probably wouldn't see any reductions um, of ticks on the, your, on the animal hosts. All right, so I, we can not talk about um, ticks and tick-borne diseases without talking about tick bite prevention. Um, it's sort of like our, our number one, our, you know, our staple here. At the Center of Excellence, we want to make sure um, that everyone is safe while they're out there doing field work or while they're out there just, you know, just going for a walk or stroll in the, in the woods. Um, and when it comes to tick bite prevention, you have to remember that DEET is king. Um, DEET is the best thing that, you know, DEET is probably the best thing you can use to protect yourself. But more importantly, 40% um, DEET is what you should be uh, aiming for. And then less than that, um, it's still effective, but not as effective as 40% or higher. Something else you can also use is the, these uh, permethrin products. And so this is meant for you to um, treat your clothing. And so after you treat your clothing, if there are any ticks that climb onto you, they'll get that lethal dose of that permethrin and it'll kill them. Um, and you can also purchase clothing that are already impregnated with this permethrin, um, but that's a lot more um, costly. And so, you know, when you, if you're trying to save money, um, the Sawyer product here, you can get at Walmart, Home Depot and so forth for just about 15 
uh, maybe $20 at most. And so it's really uh, cheap, it's cost effective, and you can treat, you know, two to three pants um, or outfits with this, and that will last you five to six washings. Um, and for a lot of people, that's, you know, for our, our team at least, that's half the summer of protection just from one bottle of permethrin. Um, if you're doing field work or if you're out in the woods doing other, um, you know, agency related projects, we highly recommend you use rubber boots. Um, anecdotally, this seems to be very good at protecting our students and, and ourselves and our on all of our field technicians. Um, you know, the ticks, the nymphal ticks are out and active during the, uh, the summer months are, they, they tend to quest at a lower height. And so having these tall rubber boots um, seem to be really good at, at keeping the ticks off of our students. So highly recommend that if you're doing any sort of work, um, field work, or, you know, even if you're going hunting, that you wear some rubber boots. Um, and of course, you know, to, to sort of finish off the, you know, the, the tick, prevent, tick bite prevention here, I just want to sort of put a little plug in for tick removal. Um, we've heard, you know, through my time uh, doing presentations, I've heard so many different crazy stories about how to remove a tick. Um, I just want to make sure we get the right information out there. When you remove a tick, the proper method is to grab it by the mouth part, not by the body um, or anywhere else. Grab it by the head, closer towards the mouth, and slowly pull it out. That's the CDC method. For wood ticks, it works, it works wonderfully. They come out pretty easily because they have a shorter mouth part. Um, but for black legged ticks, their mouth parts tend to be a little bit longer. So you have to do a little bit more coaxing to get them out of there. Um, and part of that is because when they embed themselves into you, they secrete this cement that really glues their mouth parts into you until they're ready to remove it. Um, and so if you can't coax it out, um, and you yank on it, chances are you'll get the tick out. The tick will come off, but the mouth parts will be left inside of you. Um, one other method that I've seen or I've used myself um, actually that seems to work pretty well are these tick tornado. Um, and the idea here is that you, you stick this little thing underneath the, the tick, so around the mouth parts, and then you, instead of pulling it out, you twist it and that'll kick the tick out of there. Um, I've done this a couple of times and it has worked way better then the CDC recommended method of just um, pulling it out. Um, and so if you're out there and you get a tick bite on you and you have one of these tick tornadoes on hand, um, try it and let me know if it works. Um, and much like the tick app, um, we also have another service called the, called the Wisconsin Medical Entomology Lab Identification Service. Um, and so here, you know, this is a web-based um, uh, identification service. So if you don't want to use an app, um, you can use this service, and in this service, the same thing. You go to the website, you click on that, and we'll ask you a number of questions, um, and you can submit an image for us to uh, ID, and again, we'll uh, identify for you within 24 hours and send you what that identification is, and then send you some recommendations as to what you can do um, if you were bitten by that tick as well. Um, and finally, as a public health entomologist, I just can't, can't get through this without saying that you that anybody can do tick surveillance. Um, and so, you know, in this backyard, uh, you know, the homeowners can grab a drag or, you know, a piece of cloth and they can do tick dragging here. But more importantly, if you are an agency and you are available in tick surveillance, um, we do have equipment available and we can train you on how to do tick surveillance. And it's pretty easy. You know, it'll take maybe one or two hours of your day um, to go out there and put that drag down um, and collect ticks, you know, and we'll provide you with all other equipment. And so outside of the drag, our other equipments are just, you know, sample vials, forceps to collect the ticks, and, you know, labeling tape to label the specimens. And then we also have these lint rollers um, that we use to pull up larvae because, you know, some, sometimes you get a huge batch of them and it just takes forever to slowly pluck them out. So if there are any agencies or departments out there that are interested in doing surveillance for ticks, um, let me know. And we'll be more than happy to provide you with the equipment to do that surveillance and the training um, to do it effectively as well. Um, and so with that, I think we're, um, I'm at the end of my presentation. Thank you, Dr. Lee. That was fascinating. And I appreciate that you're giving us all a chance to participate in some citizen science there so that we can get information back to you as well as learn from you. Uh, so I wanted to say we're just about at 930, but we would like to stay for another 15 minutes to take some questions. We have some great questions in our Q&A box. Here's the last chance to put some in the Q&A box before um, we go. And if you have any comments, put them in the chat. I've also put some links for our 
two future programs in June that continue the conversations about ticks. So feel free to register using those links. And then before you go, if you could fill out a short anonymous survey about the program to help us know what you liked and what else you'd like to learn, uh, please use that link in the chat box. So Jennifer, why don't we take a look at what's in the Q&A box? Great. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. And thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Um, it looks like some of these questions have kind of been answered, but I'm going to read them off anyways. Um, <clears throat> there was a uh, top question was, uh, sounds like you talked about uh, how mowing in impacted uh, the ticks. And so with the new no mow may um, kind of uh, push, does the no mow may affect the tick habitat by increasing the tick population? <laughs> Yeah, so the no mow may, so we've gotten this question before and um, we don't have direct evidence on on lawn, um, residential lawn itself. A lot of the, the work has, you know, our work here, as you can see, um, was done on recreational trails. But, you know, I my uh, assumption based on all the work that we've done, especially in the Eau Claire and the, the, um, the Dells area, that mowing does not seem to impact ticks that are on uh, lawns, unless you are in an area where your lawn is huge um, and it's uh, it's open and there's a lot of sunlight, in which case it's not the, the mowing that's really killing the ticks. It's really just that exposure to all that heat. Excellent. Thank you. Um, another question uh, uh, regarding suburban lawns. Would an irrigated suburban lawn be a good environment to harbor ticks? Yeah, and again, that comes back to the size of the lawn. If the you know if you have a really large lawn, chances are it's going to be in that open sunny area, and so your your chances of of coming to contact with a tick in that area would be really low, as opposed to an area that's right next to the woods that's very shaded. You have a lot of trees there to keep it nice and cool. Um, if that's well uh, irrigated and it keeps the, the the area nice and moist, that could also you know uh, increase tick numbers there. But you know again, we don't have the evidence on those properties to suggest whether or not irrigation would increase tick numbers in in that environment, um, but I suspect that you know as you um, you know in those shade areas that tick numbers would be uh, fairly high. Okay, thank you. Um, and this is a question I had too because um, I've I've heard that Lone Star ticks are moving. Um, are there Lone Star ticks in Wisconsin or Michigan, like in the UP? What is the incidence of alpha of the alpha gal? I might be mispronouncing that. Apologies. Um, allergy. Once heard a researcher say that humans with alpha gal are immune are immune to Lyme's disease. Is there any research on this? So it's a couple questions in one. Well. The um, Lone Star Tick is not established in Wisconsin. So what we see is on occasion, it looks like something may come in on a bird and drop off and there'll be the one off one tick that somebody encounters in a county. But we don't have any evidence that they're able to make it through our winters. So our records are pretty spotty. We have maybe 20, 25 re reports over the years where, yep, we got the specimen, we could identify it as a lone star. So we know that, yes, occasionally they're introduced here and people do pick them up. Um, in other parts of the country where they're very common, this issue of the, uh, the meat allergy, which sometimes is also dairy, um, is a problem. I mean, uh, several thousand people now have been diagnosed with this meat allergy, and it's a, um, thought to be a result of being bitten by a lone star tick and this uh, reaction to the alpha-gal uh, uh, moiety that you find in tick saliva. So I have had anecdotal reports from people in Wisconsin that they too are experiencing the anti-meat allergy. It's not a reportable disease, so we don't have any numbers, but I think it's something that both state and federal officials are getting much more interested in. So I think we're going to have better numbers coming up over the next few years. So I do think some people do get exposed to the Lone Star ticks in our state and also possibly through their own travels, right, and could be getting um, this condition. For a lot of people who get it, it seems to go away, uh, but not for everybody. So it's it's something to be concerned about. Great. Thank you. Um, so I'm, there's a couple of questions here that I'm going to combine because they're, they're similar. So Susan Cushing and Julie Wellness um, were concerned about or talking a little bit about the use of pesticides to control ticks, um, considering that these pesticides can, can 
on the on the label say that they uh, can control uh, excuse me control over 100 insects what does chemical treatment do for beneficial pollinators um, and should this basically be used as a last resort considering its possible impact on pollinators and other wildlife you know the product that we i'll turn it over to z in a second but i was just going to say the product that we chose to test was a granular insecticide so it stays down in the soil as opposed to being something liquid that you spray on just everything flowers and all that are uh, above ground so um, and we chose to do it as a barrier treatment so we just did it in a narrow area right between the where the woods and the lawn um, abutted instead of like treating the entire lawn. Uh, so we were trying to be um, careful about potential impacts on pollinators, which are primarily going to be going to the flowering plants, right, to get the nectar and the pollen. Um, we do spray a lot of pesticides. We're an agricultural state and there is a lot of pesticide use here. And, you know, we offer this up for, I think, people who are comfortable with the use of pesticides in their in their yards uh, and would want to have something that could protect themselves and their maybe their grandkids who are running around in that yard from exposure to ticks and to Lyme disease. But it definitely, you know, would not be a solution for people who are uncomfortable with that. And in that sense, we're trying to work towards products that are much less toxic that can be used in these kinds of settings. We're not there yet, but those are definitely some of the key uh, targets for the Center of Excellence Research in the next five years. Anything to add, Zia? Yeah, no, I agree with, with everything there that we are moving towards more targeted um, products that target just ticks. And a lot of what we use here are, um, you know, for, you know, as Susan mentioned, uh, what we use there, the triazides are granular, so it sticks to the ground. Um, and so pollinators, especially uh, butterflies and, and bees, um, are not, you know, should not be affected by this um, unless you, you know, use it incorrectly um, against the label. Um, and even with the, uh, the liquid pesticides, that in order for that to be effect effective, you really have to push it into the, the leaf litter or into the ground. And so you wouldn't want to be spraying that all over the plants. You want to be focused just on the ground. Um, and that should alleviate some of the, the issues there. And you know, the recommendation is to sort of move towards that barrier treatment and not just spray it all over the place. And so this is where um, potentially uh, you could run into troubles with PCOs or you know, pest control operators. If they're not used, doing it correctly, they may end up treating everything. Um, and so you know, I think in general, we are moving towards um, not using general uh, you know, broad spectrum of care site, more towards targeted um, products. Great, thank you. Um, and with that in mind, um, this is kind of similar. So many of the recommendations for tick prevention and control seem to conflict with recommendations to promote habitat for wildlife and pollinating insects in your yard. So in, like, in terms of removing leaf litter and removing shrubs and so forth, do you have any thoughts about these, about how to reconcile these con seemingly conflicting priorities? <laughs> Yeah, and I think the best approach to this is to target areas, or, you know, if you're a homeowner, to target areas around your home that are high traffic areas, right? So you don't have to remove all of this within your property. If you know that you'll be um, in the lawn, um, you can just work on that. And one other thing um, that does seem to work is, you know, as, as we mentioned before, that seems to work is to put it around a barrier treatment. And that doesn't have to be pesticides. You can use other things such as wood chips that have, um, have proven to be effective at reducing tick. Uh, numbers and, and reducing the movement of ticks from wood areas and into your lawns. There are a number of things that you can do outside of, you know, destroying completely uh, the landscape completely and and doing other things. And so that's definitely something that we can definitely talk about, um, you know, at, at you know at, at at a later time. But you know, here we just want to sort of present some of the work that we've done, especially with the removal of the of the invasives. You know, those we don't want here in the first place, especially Japanese. Japanese barber, if you've ever been in a patch of Japanese barber, it's not fun. Um, and so by removing those, by removing buckthorn, by removing um, invasive honeysuckle, we're sort of removing these invasives um, and hoping that our natural uh, you know, vegetation can come back and re uh, uh, reseed in those areas. Um, and so by removing those, we're hopefully we're doing, doing a couple of things, creating that environment for our natural plants to come back, and then also you know, removing that suitable habitat for ticks. Excellent, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna combine another uh, two questions here, Carl Kozak and 
uh, Karen Schrieber asked about deer and ticks. Um, so if, if deer are carriers, uh, would reducing the deer population decrease the incident of tick-borne disease? And also if deer are carriers, how can we keep them out of my yard? Keeping deer out of my yard. Yeah. You know, the, the importance of deer has is, is been a controversial topic in some of the Lyme disease research. It, it looks like you have to reduce the abundance of deer down to such a low level that it just wouldn't be possible in Wisconsin, you know, given the the affection that a lot of people have for their hunting traditions. Um, just don't think it's something that we could easily do. Um, there are some things that people do, uh, some tools that people do on the East Coast that people in Wisconsin tend not to use. A lot more folks that we surveyed in, um, say, the Staten Island area actually do fencing around their yard to try to keep the deer out. And we were surprised to learn um, in our surveys using the Tick app that in Wisconsin, actually, quite a few people were actively trying to pull the deer in because, you know, through feeding, they enjoy seeing them and they enjoy sharing that wildlife with the grandkids and others. So um, I think if you want to keep them out, it can be really difficult to do. But the fencing, uh, although an expensive strategy, is certainly something that others have used in other parts of the country specifically for trying to reduce slime uh, incidents and, and risk on the properties. Other than that, if anyone has suggestions, I'm open to them. But that's really the main um, strategy that I know about. Is that, or the person who asked the question made a comment about uh, someone had mentioned flakes of Irish soap around the perimeter. Is that, have I'd you heard of that? I'd be surprised. <laughs> that would be my answer. I'd be very surprised if that was a deterrent, but. Um, okay, let's see. Um, have you checked fire as a control method for ticks? We have not, Zia. I don't know if you want to speak to that a little bit. Some of our colleagues have looked at fire. Yeah, we um, we've been approached a couple of times to <laughs> to see if we were and wanted to to check on that. But you know, based we have not ourselves, but based on some of the previous literature and some of our colleagues, um, fire does tend to suppress it a little bit. But depending on how you look at it, um, our colleagues have reported you know either no effect or increases in ticks after a fire. And that could be because you're wiping away a lot of vegetation, exposing the ticks, um, or it could be for other reasons, but it doesn't seem to have that big of an impact. You would think that burning the, the landscape would you know, remove a lot of the, the critters there, but in this case, I guess the ticks are down deep enough that it doesn't seem to make that big of an impact. Thank you. Do you happen to know if, if counties and municipalities uh, typically spray tra trails for ticks? Yeah, not in particular. Um, you know, spraying for ticks is pretty expensive and a lot, I mean, a lot of these rec parks don't have the money to, to spend on that. Even mowing trails is, you know, is a little bit expensive. My understanding, yeah, is same that they do not do any treatment of trails with pesticides. I'm gonna combine uh, two other questions here. Um, one is about, uh, is is there or was there a Lyme's uh, disease vaccination available or, and is, have you heard of any uh, development of an mRNA vaccine for Lyme's? There used to be a vaccine available, but that one was taken off the market a long time ago. Um, my understanding is that there are currently two products that are in late stage testing that could be out in just the next couple of years. Um, I'm not aware. I don't think either one of them is an mRNA vaccine. Uh, I think they're both kind of traditional antigen based, but surely after all that's been going on with COVID, somebody is working on the mRNA. So we'll keep you up posted as we learn more. Great, thank you. Four um, minutes left, Jennifer, if you want to just take one or two questions. Sure. Um, let's see. I know that we're going to be having a, a talk, or there is going to be a talk that's going to focus more on the diseases and, and the symptoms of those diseases, correct? That's Lisa? correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Okay, so we talked about the lo about longhorn tick. Um, 
We talked about Lone Star. We didn't talk about the long, the Longhorn, the invasive oh. tick that they're seeing on the East Coast more and is okay. actually moving in this direction. I think Wisconsin's going to be too cold for that. Some of the modeling suggests our winters will be much like they are for the Lone Star tick and just not something that one can get through. I know some of our surrounding states are quite worried because it's a big pest for livestock in particular. <laughs> And this is a question that I actually had too. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna piggyback on this one. If you pull a tick off, but you leave the head, can you still transmit, can it still transmit disease? No, the, the head should not be able by itself. If you've left the mouth parts in, they shouldn't be able to transmit disease. We do worry that if you squish the abdomen, when you tried to pull it out, that you could have forced it to uh, regurgitate or put more saliva into the skin just through that pressure. Um, but but the mouth parts by themselves should not be able to transmit anything. Okay, so I, I'm trying to scan through the, the questions to kind of summarize because there's a um, there's a bunch of questions that are similar. So I'm trying to um, <clears throat> so what time of year are nymphs most active? Great question. So right now, um, nymphs are uh, active, but the peak is usually that third week in June to that first week in July, at least at our Wisconsin site. So July 4th, um, July 8th, right in there. And then they start to tail off, but that doesn't mean they're not out there. That's just the peak period, June through early July. Okay, and since we have just a, a couple of minutes left, I think this is a kind of an, an easy one. Would you recommend like if would running a lint roller over yourself after being outside in the woods be an effective way to pick up nymphs and ticks off of yourself? Hmm. Over your clothes. I don't know about your skin. That's an interesting idea. Hmm. We'll and have they don't to specify test. skin or clothing. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to test question. it. We do recommend those tic tacs. And I've often thought about, well, how do people, how are they supposed to do that on their backs? You know, I suspect if it's embedded, if it's already in your skin, it's probably not going to help at all. But if it was a loose tick still walking around trying to find a place to land, maybe. So maybe um, when we come back for another talk, you'll hear about our patented product, the lint roller for your back. <laughs> <laughs> So are, are we at time, Lisa, or do we have time for one more? Um, time for one more and then we'll close up. Okay, so um, even though we do have a disease one uh, seminar coming up, I do want to ask this question um, just because uh, in case folks aren't able to make it to the next one, they're asking about the symptoms of leaf-borne uh, diseases and are, do, do they have similar symptoms? Um. Of all the tick-borne diseases, I'm sorry, I wasn't quite yes. clear. Yes. Do yes. all tick, tick transmitted diseases have similar symptoms? You know, for the most part, a lot of the symptoms are. They're like summer flu, muscle aches, fatigue, fever. There are some differences. Um, like the Lyme disease, if you're lucky, you will get a rash, expanding large rash at the site of the tick bite that sometimes looks like a bullseye, but not always. Uh, that one is distinctive from the others. Like a true Rocky Mountain spotted fever has a rash that's quite distinctive from the others. Um, but for the most part, those summer flu symptoms are pretty similar, a fever, um, muscle aches, fatigue, those things. So we do always recommend if you get sick in the summer, summer flu, with COVID things have changed, but summer flu is not very common. So it's, it's useful to go and see your doctor if you've been in a place where you think you could have been exposed to a tick. And if you get a tick, you should save it and take it to them um, so they know you've, you you know, you have had that exposure. Well, thank you very much. This has been really, really informative. I know I learned a lot and I appreciate um, presentations by both Dr. Paskowitz and Dr. Lee. I wanna thank my co-hosts for helping run all the different functions of this webinar. We didn't get to all the questions today, but I'll talk to the speakers to see if there's a way that we can do a quick write-up or um, combine them and answer them in the future. I am sending a, an email to all the registrants after this program that'll have the correct links to the website restoration or re registration pages, some follow-up information, a link to the future recording. We do have to get it captioned, so it'll be a few days. But we will send follow-up with um, 
all of the information that you've been asking about. So I want to thank you all. I hope we can see you in the next two TikToks that we're offering in June. And um, be safe out there and take good precautions. Thanks, everybody.